amazing privilege it is to be gathered here with these men and women. Um, I am just personally grateful for each and every one of them in this room, and um, I'm excited by the opportunity that we have been afforded by you to weekly gather together to study your word, God. Um, there's so many people who would love this opportunity, uh, and we've got it, but we usually take it for granted, God. So as we go into your word, let us not waste the time we have here, but let us draw near to the throne of grace, and let us hear what you would speak to us through your word. Give us humble hearts, give us repentant hearts, and give us hearts that are ready for conviction. Because if there's one thing that the book of James does well, it's convict. So help us see the places where maybe we're not living up to snuff when it comes to this stuff, God. And help us repent and help us apply these things in a way that isn't just empty, mindless religious action, but that actually flows from a heart of faith and love and devotion towards the one who deserves everything. We love you, God. We praise you. We thank you for who you are. And we thank you for giving us the opportunity to be made more and more like you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So, uh, Lord willing, Joseph will be showing up within the next few minutes uh, because he is the one leading us today. Um, but he does, like, he gets off work at 7 p.m. And so he has to drive here from there. And so he's just going to be probably like walking in and sitting down and going. Uh, and so my job is to kind of just summarize the context until he arrives. Uh, and if for some reason he doesn't show up, then I will just lead us through it. Um, but that'll be fine. And just as a reminder, um, Joseph should be leading today. And then Rocky, you are in charge next week. And you get to talk about what is probably one of the most popular passages uh, in the entire book of James. Uh, I actually gave you, I think you have the shortest section that we're covering um, in any given week just because um, so we can go really in depth. So good luck. Uh, and I'll try to send you some resources um, that you can like check out and stuff in between. Um, okay, cool. So today we're going to be hopping in at James chapter 1 verse 19 uh, and we're going through uh, chapter 2 verse 13 which this actually might be the longest section we're covering. Um, and the main reason I did this is because I just kind of felt like the things just naturally flowed from one to the other. Um, and we're going to be talking about some really good stuff today. Um, but let's start with a little bit of context, right? Because not everybody was here last week, um, and it's just also very helpful. And, you know, uh, we're also recording this thing, and there's probably going to be people watching online, and who knows, maybe they didn't see last week's video. So let's maybe start with some review. Who is James? Jesus' brother. Jesus' brother, right? Um, there's different Jameses who show up in the Bible, but um, as best we can tell, and according to basically um, unanimous early church history, the James that we're talking about who wrote this is the brother of Jesus. What is the name James actually originally? Jacob? Jacob, Jacob? yeah. Uh, it's Jacob. I talked about it last week, how I think it's unfortunate that we translate this as James, um, because Jacob has a much richer biblical history in the name. Like, if you were to go look in Greek, Jacob and James are the same exact thing. Um, but for different historical reasons, we've translated that as James when you get to the New Testament most of the time. And so that's just as it is. Um, so James, brother of Jesus. What else do we know about James? In addition to being the brother of Jesus, um, what other significant things do we know about him when it comes to the early church? Was it written? Was it one of the first New Testament books to be written? Yeah, this most likely, uh, there's a strong argument to be made that this is the earliest New Testament book to be written, um, somewhere between A.D. 44 to 49, by some people's estimations. Um, but what else do we know about James the man? Um, what was his role in the church? What did he do? He's a, yeah, bond servant of God. He led yeah. the church in Jerusalem. Yeah, he led the church in Jerusalem. That's kind of a really big deal. We need to not forget that. Um, after the apostles scattered due to growing persecution, uh, James, he stayed back, right? You have to keep in mind, James himself was not an apostle, but you could number him, I guess, amongst the what we could call the apostolic men, right? So he's not an apostle, but he belongs to like the, the group just beyond that, right? Uh, and basically, like... Once the apostles scattered, like and when I talk about the apostles, I'm primarily talking about like the 12, right? The 12 apostles. Um, obviously, there's the whole Judas thing, but after Judas died, they replaced him. There were 12 apostles. 
They scattered probably somewhere between AD 42 and 44 after James, son of Zebedee, was killed. So the first of the apostles, he was killed. And then the apostles spread out. But this James, he stayed back in Jerusalem, which is the first church, right? I mean, the Christians were gathered in Jerusalem whenever the Spirit descended upon them. And like, so this is where Christianity was born, right? It was born in Jerusalem. And uh, when the apostles scattered, James held down the fort and he became like the bishop or the pastor of the Jerusalem church, which is really cool. Uh, and we actually read about this from even outside the Bible. I'm pretty sure Josephus mentions this, uh, where he, he talks about there being James, you know, uh, he was also known as James the Just uh, because he took everything very seriously. Uh, and I don't, don't, go look this up for yourself, but I'm pretty sure there's a tradition that he was such a devout person that like his knees were like calloused because of how much time he spent on them like praying. Uh, like, like this dude was a devout guy who was intense in his spiritual disciplines. Uh, and you see that reflected in the um, letter that he writes. Uh, okay, cool. Um, Joseph just said he's going to be a little bit later than normal. So um, he said just get started without him, which is fine. Okay, um, other thing worth mentioning. Um, there's a lot of references in this book. Uh, two primary references that I mentioned. Um, like that there's really just like a lot of quotations and stuff from it. Uh, what is one of them? What's that? Quotation, the doers of the word, not the doers of the word. Well, yes, so we'll get to that, but I'm talking about there's specific allusions and references that are calling back to something else that James seems to make in this letter. It's trials? Like, so those are themes oh, yeah. that show up. The Old Testament. So he, he quotes the Old Testament a lot, right? He quotes it or he alludes to it, and specifically, um, there's a lot of parallels with this book and the book of Proverbs. Right? There's a lot of stuff, like if you just go look in Proverbs, you will see that very similar points are being made. Uh, which is cool because what we see is that James is a very practical book, as you can see by the title of what I've called this one. Right? Hearers and doers of the word. Right? You hear and you do. Right? So, very practical book. It quotes the Old Testament and it alludes to the Old Testament a lot, specifically Proverbs. But there's also something that we find in the New Testament that it alludes to quite a bit. Um, even though some people would debate whether or not the book that this is found in was written yet. I would actually argue that it probably was written, um, but whether it was being distributed, I have no idea, because um, I think ultimately it's sourced in the same place that James is currently ministering. Um, what does he allude to? Probably the most famous sermon ever preached. The Beatitudes? The Sermon on the Mount. Yes, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Basically, one way that I like to look at the book of James is almost like a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. Again, people will debate whether or not the Gospel of Matthew had been written at this time. I actually argue that it might have been. Um, but even regardless of that, the sermon was preached 15 years early, over 15 years earlier. Uh, and James grew up with the guy who preached it. right? And so you can see that this is a guy who grew up with Jesus. He knew Jesus well. But he didn't actually believe in Jesus prior to the resurrection. If you remember that, we talked about that a little bit, how um, basically during his lifetime, all of Jesus' family rejected him. But then after the resurrection, he appeared to them and they believed. Uh, and so we actually have two books of the Bible that are written by Jesus' siblings. But there's James and what's the other one? It's in the New Testament, right? Yeah. The letter? Jude. James, Jude. Jude. James and Jude. Uh, there you go. James. Uh, yes, James and Jude. All right, cool. So that's just like the context when it comes to who's writing this. What It's being written to the dispersed Jews, right? So it could be dispersed Christian Jews, or it could just be dispersed Jews in general, right? Because the Jews have been dispersed a while back, and so he could just be writing to Jewish people arguing for the faith. Um, but let's actually talk about what we covered um, last week. Uh, in verses 1 through 18, which Sean led that. I thought he did a great job, and everybody in the YouTube comments thought you did a great job too. Um, just so you know, people were like, nice, good job. Um, and so Sean did a good job there, but let's recap. What did James talk about, or what is the driving theme of really this entire book? You see it in the op some of the opening words. Count it all joy. Count it all joy when? You meet trials of various kinds. When you meet trials of various kinds. Mm -hmm. Right? Basically, this entire book has to be read in light of persecution. Right? He is writing to people who have been dispersed because of growing persecution. 
and he is arguing for a radical viewpoint. He is saying, hey guys, uh, rather than feeling down in your luck and playing the victim card whenever life gets hard, that rhymed. <laughs> uh, rather than playing the victim card when life gets hard, instead, count it joy. What? You want me to count it joy when life gets difficult? Yes, I do. And you might ask yourself, why do you want me to count it joy? And James explains, count it all joy when you face trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith brings about perseverance, and that perseverance have its perfect work, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So he says, don't waste the pain that you're going through, right? God has a, like, he's appointed this pain for a reason. And if your life is difficult, and it's not because you're sinning, right? If, you, if your life is difficult because you're sinning, repent. But if you've been faithful to God and your life is getting harder, that means that God has allowed this for a reason. Don't waste it. Instead, lean into it and count it joy and rejoice in the fact that God has deemed you worthy to go through this trial in order to grow you and perfect you and strengthen you. That's a radical perspective to take, but it's the one he's taking and it's the one that's consistent with the rest of the testimony of the Bible. Right? The apostles, the way that they viewed suffering is way different than how we view it. Right? Whenever we encounter suffering, we're like, how do I get out of this as soon as possible? Whereas when they encountered suffering, they're like, where do I find God in this? And how does God receive the glory through my suffering? Either through my growth or through the growth of the church. And so that's the main context that we've got to understand James through. Right? Counting it joy in the midst of suffering. And ultimately, he points out that um, basically everybody on earth is facing a trial. Right? Uh, some trials are more physical in nature, some are more spiritual in nature, and some might be physical in nature, but not in the way you might think, right? And so what he's going to do throughout pretty much the majority of this book is he's going to contrast two types of people, the rich and the poor, right? Uh, and typically the rich people are the ones that we appreciate, and they're the ones that we want to be like. And James says, well, you know, being rich isn't all that it's, you know, snuffed out to be. It's, it's not, not everything's hunky-dory for the rich people uh, because they have a trial of their own. Because they are going to be more inclined to identify themselves with the things of the world and not to trust in God and rely on God for their provision. And therefore, one day, whenever all their riches fade away, there's a good chance that they might not have ever learned to trust in God during their life. And that's not going to go well for them in the end. Right? On the other hand, poor people we don't typically want to be like because we see their trial. Right? Their trial is easy for us to perceive. Hardship. Right? We like knowing where our next meal is coming from. We like having fancy clothes. And so we can see their trial. We don't want to be like them. But James is like, well, you know, there's also positives to that as well, right? Because those people, they've been deprived of these physical needs, and therefore they are forced to rely on God. And so basically what he's doing is he's just trying to take away our perspective of valuing one over the other, right? Both being rich and being poor has both its benefits and its hardships. And really we need to learn how to be faithful in the midst of all of it, right? Whether you're rich or you're poor, be faithful to God. When you're rich, you face the challenge of not relying on your riches. And if you're poor, you face the challenge of enduring through the poverty and learning to rely on God. Right? And so either way, there's hardship. But if you trust God through that hardship and you count it joy, your faith will be perfected and you'll grow. And ultimately, what he's going to eventually talk about, he's going to talk about favoritism. And I believe that's what we're getting to today. Right? Uh, because whenever it comes to showing favoritism to people, who do we typically show favoritism towards? The rich. Right? Whenever a poor person walks into our church, it's not like we shine a spotlight on them and say, look who decided to show up today. But if the mayor is sitting in our congregation, we'll say, mayor, I'm glad you decided to show up to church today. It's good to see you. Right? And we shine all the spotlight on the people who, and that person's not rich, but they're prominent. Right? Uh, we like shining the spotlight on prominent people. Right? Whenever a person makes a huge donation to the church, the pastor walks up there and says, Man, the Lord blessed us today with this huge paycheck, and I just wanted to call this person up and shake their hands. Thank you so much. But whenever the poor person donates a penny, nobody says anything. Right? And James is going to call out that hypocrisy in this. Because that's not something unique to the modern church. That's something that is just it's common to the human tradition, uh, the human condition. Right? We naturally favor those people who have what we want. And so if we're favoring the rich, James is pointing out, maybe you're valuing the wrong thing, right? Because uh, Jesus, we saw what he valued if you go back to the Gospels, right? He sees these people giving all this money into the treasury, and he's like, yeah, those people are doing fine. But you know who I care for? That widow. She has no money, 
And that little penny that she dropped in there was everything she had. And like, that's what moved his heart. And so if we want to be like God, and to go back to our question of the week, if we want to mimic the character of God, then we need to learn what he values, and we need to learn to value the same thing. Mm-hmm. And so that's really what James has been walking us through. Uh, and so he said we need to count it joy in the midst of trials. And if you're wondering how do I go about that, well, he gives us this amazing promise. If you lack wisdom, ask God. He'll give you the wisdom, right? If you don't know how to find the joy through this hardship and you don't know how to push through, ask God and he will give you the way out. But you need to make sure you ask in faith because if you're not asking in faith, that means that you're really probably secretly just asking for a way out of the trial, but you're trying to act like you're seeking God in the midst of it. He says, no, genuinely trust God to get you through it and ask him how to be faithful. Right? Your goal should not be to get out of the trial. It should be to be faithful through the trial. Speaking of which, uh, he talks about how God doesn't show favoritism. Right, The sun shines on both people, the rich and the poor. And so whenever you're in a situation and you feel tempted to sin, specifically in a trial, right? when you're in this hardship and you're tempted to sin, don't blame that temptation on God. Right, uh, And the way that we kind of talked about that is that don't allow your circumstances to be an excuse for your actions. Right? Oh, well, the only reason I committed sin A, B, and C is because I was put in situation X, Y, and Z. Okay, well, God's the one who allowed you to be put in that situation. And so if you're saying the reason you sinned is because you were there in that situation and that you wouldn't have sinned otherwise, you're really blaming God for it. What you have to realize is you're responsible for your sin. Right? And so when you're in the midst of a trial and you sin, take responsibility for it and recognize that all bad things come from you and come from the external force of the evil powers they get, right? The devil. Mm-hmm. All good things, on the other hand, come from the Father of lights, right? So rather than blaming God for all the evils in the world and for all the evil, blame God for all the good things. And when I say blame, I mean recognize that he is the one who gives good things despite our evil nature, right? And be grateful to him. Uh, usually we do the reverse, right? Especially if you look at our modern culture. Even Christians, we blame God for evil things. How could God allow such evil in the world? It's like, oh, have you read the Bible? <laughs> it's like, I mean, there, he has reasons for allowing it. And usually, and we're the reason. <laughs> like, We're the ones who brought this evil. Really, the more surprising thing is the fact that God has been good to us despite our evil. Because technically, we deserve the worst. Mm-hmm. And so really, James is just trying to get us to just totally shift our perspectives. Um, don't be deceived, brothers. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, right? If you can learn to recognize what's coming from God and what's coming from your own sinful heart, you will be a million time, a million steps ahead of anybody, of pretty much everybody else in the world, because most often we've got a skewed view of that. And that leads us into chapter one, verse nineteen, right? And this is what we read: Know this, my beloved brothers, but everyone must be quick to hear. Slow to speak and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, laying aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in your gentleness receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But become doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, He is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he looked at himself and has gone away, he immediately forgot what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in what he does. That was perfect timing, my friend. One of the registers is giving me problems tonight. So. No problem, my friend. Yeah, that was actually perfect timing. We just finished the context, and I just read the passage. So Really? There you go. All right. Yeah. Um, I'll get it started, though, so you can kind of not just have to walk in and hit the ground running. All right, so what do we see right here? Anything that stick out to y'all? Let's see. I did make some. Let me find my notes so they do commentary on this. Last week. Yeah, no problem. I will we'll say this. Uh huh. Last. I mean, I don't even know if this is necessarily correct, but I feel like in the past, whenever I've read this, I kind of read this in isolation compared to like the previous mm-hmm. verses. And so I kind of just read slow to speak, or quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger as like being necessarily between like other people. Mm-hmm. And that is true, but like. 
I think this is probably more so referring to like asking of God. Okay. Does that make sense? No, I think that does make sense. Uh, and I'm glad you highlighted this um, because typically verse, div- like, I mean, section divisions in the Bible can actually do us a little bit of injustice, right? Because like even in my Bible right here, right? Verse 18 and verse 19 are separated into two different sections. And verse 19 says doers of the word. And so whenever we read it, we almost treat it like a separate section. And sometimes that's valid, right? Sometimes the person is literally just shifting in thought. In James, though, I don't really see as much room for that division, right? Because usually, like, usually, like, Paul will do this sometimes. He'll be like, okay, in regards to this, and then he'll give a long thing. And then he'll say, now in regards to this other subject, and, like, so he'll clearly say, here's a new thought. Whereas James kind of does just flow through it. But like Sean just pointed out, usually when people address verse 19, they speak of it in isolation, right? And they just talk about this is how we should be in regards to other people. Now, do I agree that we should be this way in regards to other people? Yeah, absolutely. But I I also agree with Sean that maybe the context preceding it should inform how he specifically means it right here, right? So it says, know this, my beloved brothers. And he just got off saying, every good thing and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. Right? So it's specifically about seeking wisdom from God, asking of him, and allowing him to provide the good things to help us endure. And then he says, know this, my beloved brothers. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So what do you think he's saying there? Yeah. And you're not to rely on yourselves to make things right. Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to just like slowing down, right? Because if, if we're specifically looking at things in light of the context of persecution or hardship, usually the first thing we want to do is get out of it, right? And we just like want like a quick answer. How do I get out of this as quickly as possible? And I think one thing that James is just encouraging us to do is slow down, right? Be patient, right? I mean... Other apostles are going to talk about this. Peter is going to talk about how, like, hey, God is not slow to fulfill his promises. He's just patient, right? Uh, Whenever Jesus says, I'm coming back soon, soon could mean 2,000 years. (laughs) So uh, God is not in a rush, and neither should we be, right? And we might even be in a rush to grow as Christians, right? We want to be perfect, lacking nothing. Yeah, 119 through. I've broken it up a little differently. No, that's fine. Well, I've got all the different slides, just like back to back. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so ultimately, I think what he's saying is to just not rush through, right? We want quick results. We want to, how do I be the perfect Christian in five minutes? How do I allow this hardship to shape me into a perfect person overnight? And I think one thing he's arguing for is that's just not how it's going to be, mm-hmm. right? And so what we need to do, and this is going to be in the context, he's setting up the idea of being hearers and doers of the word, right? So specifically in regards to scripture, right? So as you're seeking God's will, Make sure that your own will isn't getting in the way of you hearing what God actually has to say, right? So you must be quick to hear. Hear what? Well, hear God's word, right? Both what he might be communicating to you now, but also what he's communicated in the past, right? Through the scriptures. And then be slow to speak and slow to anger. Uh, We talked about this when we talked about the character of God. uh, And I referenced Exodus 34. How does scripture, how does God describe himself? Slow to anger. So if he's telling us to be slow to anger, what is he actually calling us to do? Model ourselves after God. Right? Uh, And so if we're wanting to become like God through the trials, we need to learn to react like God in the midst of that. All right. I'll get over to you. So when I initially read this, and I agree with what David said, and I also think it has a dual meaning. So what he's saying is, like, be slow to anger and listen carefully. So like, like saying, yes, listen carefully to God and what God has to say, but he's also like, in the real world, listen to what people like are saying or doing around you. So that way you can go ahead and you can like think about the scripture you read and apply scripture to a specific situation or idea or what what's going on around you. Yeah. And, and one thing to highlight there mm-hmm. is that, because I, I do think that both of those components are here because in addition to just reading scripture, you got to realize that the Bible does not know anything of an individualistic Christian, right? A Christian who 
Like, like nowadays, we just talk about our, my personal walk with Jesus. Yes, you do have a personal walk, but we also are supposed to be walking in community with one another. And so when you're going through this hardship, you've got to realize it's not you going through it alone, but if Joseph here is going through something hard, I need, I need to be going through that with him, right? And we need to be bearing that hardship together. And therefore, we need to be quick to listen to the people around us, right? Like our fellow Christians who might be trying to help us through it, right? And so I do think that both of those elements are there. Uh, and it's also just helpful to be like this in general. Um, so I, I do agree. I just wanted to clarify how you can get both of those from there. All right. Back to you. Okay. So I want to go to verse 22 where it says, Become doers of the word, not merely hearers who believe themselves. When I read this, I specifically thought about twisting scripture and how sometimes we twist scripture to defend our own actions, right? And he says, become doers of the word. So like read the word, do what it says. Don't just read it and be like, oh yeah, this fits what I do in my daily life because... I like to do what I do and follow the desires of my flesh. So that's what I thought. And then I also tied this back to Paul in 1 Corinthians because I'm going through 1 Corinthians on my, uh, in my own time. And I said, uh, and I noted how Paul was telling us in 1 Corinthians not to become, not to conform to the pattern of this world. And I believe this is also saying that. And I also said that if, uh, I'm sorry, it's been a long day. No, it's fine. Tying this back to 1 Corinthians, we're supposed to be... Okay, we're supposed to live differently from this world, and non-believers should take note of that. That's yeah. what I was going to say. Yeah. If, like, you're just going through life, and people are like... And I'm guilty of this, too, when people are like, you're just a normal person, I don't see anything different about you, then something's wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it's good that you're highlighting that because the end goal is ultimately to be like God, mm -hmm. right? And that's ultimately, like, basically James is giving us a way to be like God through hardship. Obviously, God, he, he can't exactly go through hardship in the same way that we do, right? But we can see how he handles negative situations, and we can model ourselves after him through those, right? And you see that going back to verse 20, right? For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. What is he saying right there? When we get angry, we when we get angry in our flesh, um, it doesn't bring about what God wants for us. It doesn't bring about the righteousness. You know, yes. Yeah. And what's what's specifically producing the anger here, like in the context? Well, what I when I think of uh, righteous anger versus normal anger. Normal anger, you just look at something and see something you don't like, or somebody sins against you or does something against your will, and you just get mad, and you're just like, man, I just want to knock that person out and knock them across the face. Yeah. But in reality, we should, like, slow down, take note of what happened, and take a breath, forgive them, and know that God is going to provide judgment for us. Yeah. So right there, you made a distinction. You mentioned righteous anger. Versus normal anger, right? Mm -hmm. I agree that the distinction exists. Um, but right here we got to ask, does he make that distinction? But do you think that James is prohibiting all anger in all situations? No. no, I would actually argue that later on in the book he is angry. Um, there's places where he like literally just calls people out and he's like, you need to weep. Like, <laughs> it's like he's, he's out, he seems mad. And so I would say that James does say that certain anger is allowed. But then that's why I was trying to ask, in context, what is specifically producing the anger he's talking about here? Oh, I think I know what you're getting at okay. now. Isn't it like the anger where you're like calling another brother or sister out? Maybe um, in their own sin? Well, so the, like, that's what I'm saying. There is a righteous anger, but the anger he's talking about here can't be that. Because righteous anger is obviously allowed. So what anger is he talking about here? In the trials. Probably some sort of anger arising from trials or even just arriving from other people... Other people's input, right? Uh, it could be just in general, like anger from like, man, I want to get through this trial and it's not going fast enough. Or it could be all these people trying to help me out, but I'm so blindsided by my own desires that I'm like brushing them off. Like, you know, like, you know, <laughs> like you have a brother coming up and be like, hey, like, like they're genuinely trying to help, but you're not being quick to hear. You're not being slow to speak and you're not being slow to anger. And so you're just getting frustrated with these people who are trying to help you. 
And he's pointing out, like, here you are so focused on this one thing, and maybe you're even focused on trying to be righteous, that you're actually missing the whole point, right? Maybe God allowed this trial and this hardship to endure to make you more righteous, yet you're so focused on getting out of the trial that it's making you not righteous. And so the anger is specifically something that is contrary to God's will, right? God put you here, and you're frustrated about it, and you act like your frustration is righteous. That anger does not produce the righteousness of God, right? So uh, basically he's saying, like, you're, you're a walking hypocrite. <laughs> Don't do that. The thing I liked about the verse, I don't know if it's like, again, I don't know if it's correct or not, but it kind of reminds me of like in verse 12, where it says like, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Um, like, I kind of think of like the righteousness of God, and like the crown is almost being like a similar imagery. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's like, kind of contrasting like the enduring versus the anger, which to me kind of refers to like a it's like a lack of trust. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, like he's like trying to get out of the trials. Yeah, for sure. All right, you want to pick us up with verse 21? 21, okay, therefore, the line of silent fitness that we might talk about some more gentleness received in the word for Jesus. And you can also just ask people, like, what they think about it first, too. <laughs> That's what I usually do if I'm, like, trying to get my thoughts together. Yeah, just. no, I, I know I wrote something about it. I'm just not picking it up right now, so... Yeah. Therefore, lying aside all fitness and all fitness. that remains of wickedness in your gentleness, receive the implanted word. He's talking about the word of God, which is able to save your souls. Yeah. So what do y'all think about that? What's he saying? What's he communicating? Get rid of all evilness, like evil actions and wickedness. Filthiness. I thought that said fitness first. Yeah. <laughs> filthiness. Yeah. Filthiness. filthiness. The thought said fitness, I'm like... I like to think of uh, if you're dirty, you know, like that makes me think of uh, when I'm taking a shower, I get inside the shower and it just, the water and the soap, it just uh, washes my body clean from all that dirt. I do like that the remains all that them. you can send and it still has effects later, Yeah. Like, even if you stop. Yeah, yeah I, I really like the imagery that Ben went there with like the shower thing, mm-hmm. right? Um, why, do, why do we take showers? To be clean. Yes. Right? And earlier today, like, I worked out earlier today, and uh, I could tell that I smelled horrible, <laughs> but I didn't have a chance to go home and shower before I had to run some other errands. And it was one of those things where just in interacting with people, I could tell. Like, <laughs> I was like, I am so sorry. <laughs> like, I could just tell that, like, I, I don't know if they could, like, I don't know if they could smell it, but I could. You, and you know what I'm talking about, right? When you're aware of your own filthiness, and then you ask somebody, and they're like, oh, yeah, I couldn't even smell it. Sin can be like that sometimes, right? To where you are so aware of it, and maybe other people don't know. But you're aware it's there, and it needs to go. That's great imagery. And you'll see James is a big fan of imagery. He's about to use some, right? But carry that imagery with you. Therefore, laying aside all filthiness and what remains of wickedness, well, how do you lay it aside? Get rid of it. Yeah, which, but in order to get rid of it, you have to know that it's there, yeah. Right? <laughs> So this is one of those places where, you know, like in the Psalms where, like, David prays, like, search my heart, O God, and see if there's any grievous way in me. This should be our prayer, where we're asking God, like, hey, God, like, I'm already aware of so many sinful things inside of me. Search me and show me the other stuff, right? Because I don't want to go get in the shower, clean myself off, and then realize I missed a spot, right? I want to be clean, right? So help me see all the nasty stuff. Let it all be scraped off, because according to James, that's the only way that you're going to make it through hardship, right? If there's anything in there, right? If you are, um, maybe like, if, if let's think about the trial in the form just like a temptation, right? Um, lust, right? If you have not gotten rid of all those lustful desires, which is ultimately going to be impossible, but if you have allowed just one thing to remain, then whenever that trial hits you. And the devil knows that that thing's still there. Oh, that's how he's going to entice you, mm-hmm. right? And if you haven't cleansed yourself of it, well, guess what? You're going to fall prey to it. And you're going to buckle under trial, right? So the <laughs> idea is that we need to be constantly examining ourselves and looking for filthiness so that we can pray to God and have him help wipe it off of us so that when the trial shows up, we won't be seeking a way out and we'll just look to endure, if that makes sense. Um, I really like that. 
Did you come up with any other thoughts on that verse? Uh, I was just going to say I kind of felt the same way after I was like, as far as like my physical dirtiness goes, after I got done fishing last night, like I was out there, I was cutting up mullet, I was taking stuff off the, like getting hooks out of fish and everything. I just felt a little gross afterwards, came home, take a shower, felt great. And I just got to say, like, from personal experience, it feels the same way about sin, just, like, spiritually and mentally. Like, you're in a much better place if you manage to rub off a lot of your sin. Yeah. It's really interesting how that works, though, because mm-hmm. I can guarantee, like, I'm a person who, I don't mind getting dirty, like, physically, right? I don't mind getting dirty. Right? Like, I used to do, like, obstacle races where I would literally go out and, like, just, like, run through mud and, like, do all this stuff. But as soon as I finished the race, I wanted a shower. Right? Like, there's something about it where I hate being dirty for a prolonged amount of time. Right? I wish that we, and when I say we, I'm including myself there, I wish that we hated sin to the same level. Because, like you just pointed out, there's, like, it's really refreshing to step out of a shower and just feel clean. Right? Yes. It just feels so nice. But whenever we have these sinful desires within us, for some reason, our hearts get so diluted that we actually think that it's better to just entertain the sin. Whereas in those few fleeting moments, whenever we actually have like cleansed ourselves, we're like, this is amazing. It feels great to have like an unburdened conscience before God. And like, it feels great to actually be like giving myself to him how I should. But then as soon as sin enters the picture, we're like, I don't know, maybe I like having this here. Even though, I don't know, like, whenever it comes to physical dirt, we hate it. And we're like, no, I want to be clean. But whenever sin enters the picture, for some reason, we just don't hate it as much. Well, I'm pretty much the same way, except for the fact I don't mind being dirty. I almost have to look presentable. Okay. Well, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so he says, lay all filthiness and what remains of wickedness aside, and in gentleness. Receive the implanted word. So you already talked about the word is referring to the, the word, word of God. Of God yes. Right? Um, both what is revealed at the time or what has been revealed previously. So we've got 66 mm-hmm. books. We have stuff that they didn't even have at the time. Right? So in gentleness, receive the implanted word, and it's able to save your souls. So it's not only able to save you from this trial, and it's not only to save you in this life. It can save your soul if you receive this. But how does he say we have to receive it? Gentleness. What does he mean by that? How do you gently receive the word? What does that require you to do? Read it. Think about it. Contemplate. You just can't go in there and yeah. like bowl through it. I used to do that with the Bible. I used to like used to open my Bible and just like read it to read it. And you can't do that. You have to like go in there. You have to read it. And what I do now is like when I read the Bible. I'll take notes on this thing, and I'll like read it over like three, two, sometimes even four or five times for me to fully understand what the heck is going on. And I'll like take clumps of scripture because you're supposed, you're not supposed to like isolate one verse and just take it out of context. Yeah, you take like this conglomeration or the section, and then you're supposed to read it and go through it and analyze it and learn and like look at how everything connects, and then draw something from it. And I often try to apply it to my life. Y'all want to go on a mental field trip with me real quick? All right, I need you to, in your mind's eye, travel back 2,000 years, okay? Okay. How would you receive the word back then? Spoken. Spoken, right? Nowadays, we have our Bibles right here, so whenever we think receive the word, I mean, like, everything you're saying is 100% correct, because we have a privilege that they didn't have back then, right? Like, I, like whenever I'm going through something... I have an amazing privilege. I can literally just go grab a Bible off the shelf. I can sit down and I can just read it. And like Joseph was saying, like, yeah. like we can benefit from that. I can't tell you how many times in my own life I've been going through something. And literally I'll just go to a park, grab my Bible, and just like read it until my eyes have just like gone dry from all the weeping. Yeah. Right? That's great. But back then, they didn't have that privilege, did they? And so if you're receiving the word, who are you receiving it from? Somebody else. Person. Well, it would be Somebody Jesus at that time, yeah. right? Well, Jesus is already gone at this point. It would be a fellow Christian, yeah. right? So if you're receiving the word, it's not because you have a personal copy of the scriptures, because that would have cost like an arm, a leg, and two eyeballs just in order to afford like one book of the Bible, right? 
like all this stuff is hand copied. People didn't have their own personal copies of scripture back then, right? If you're receiving the word, it is because a fellow Christian or your pastor is speaking it to you. And so if he's saying that you have to receive it with gentleness, what's he saying? What do you have to do? What's that? Keep an open mind. Open mind. You have to humble yourself, right? That's another big thing throughout the, gospel, the, the book of James, right? Humble yourself, right? Going back earlier, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Why? Because people who love you are trying to help you get through this hardship. And if you're so focused on doing things your own way, you're not going to gently receive the word that God is giving you through them. Also, David, I yeah. can kind of relate to the disciples on this, like going back to Jesus and the disciples. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many times the disciples had to ask Jesus, teacher, what do you mean? Teacher, mm -hmm. what does this mean? Why do you say these things? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Super confusing. Like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, we're not always going to know the answer, right? Uh, but yeah, so you have to gently receive it. Like what he's saying is humble yourself. Right? And that immediately leads to verse 22, which you talked about a second ago, right? Yeah, I said becomes, and this is the one that probably stuck out to me the mm -hmm. most in this whole passage, but become doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. And it kind of ties into 19, 20, 21, 22. Mm -hmm. You got to humble yourself, receive it, take it with an open heart. Don't just look at, and I'm guilty, I'm, again, I'm guilty of this too. Sometimes I'll read scripture and I'll be like, oh yeah, I do that all the time. In reality, I don't. And a lot of times God would be like, look, I know you think you're perfect in this matter, in this aspect of the law, but in reality, you did X, Y, Z, and you're not. Yeah. So, and it become like doers of the word, like live out God's law and not merely just take it and be like, oh, yeah, I do that. I'm going to go on my way and keep doing what I do in my flesh. Mm -hmm. And then also, like I said earlier about twisting scripture and like not doing that and convincing yourself. Yeah. So there's two people in this room who have a shirt on um, that looks very similar to one another. A black shirt with red text has a big well logo on the back. And in Hebrew, the phrase says, Hine Shema Mitzeba To. What does that phrase mean? To obey. Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice. Hine, behold, Shema, Mitzeba, sacrifice, Tol, good, right? What does Shema mean, though? Hear. To hear. Why do we translate it as obey? Because technically it just says, behold, to hear is better than to sacrifice. But why do we translate it as obey? I think in order, I think in order to obey, you have to hear what the per what the person is telling you, whether it's your parents or God. Yeah. You have to hear them and then you have to take action. You don't you don't only have to hear it, you have to understand it. Because yeah. I can just hear something and go one in one ear and out the other and I won't react or do anything to it. Yeah. Biblically speaking, it doesn't do any good to hear something if what you hear doesn't change how you live. Right? Uh, for instance, um, if two children are playing out in the backyard and their mother comes out and says, Hey, it's time for dinner and then 10 minutes later, the mom comes out and says, did you hear me? And they're still playing, and they say, yeah, we heard you. She's going to be like, I don't think you did. Why would she be confused? Because they did hear her. But what's she confused about? They didn't respond. Yeah. <laughs> okay, if you heard me, then why aren't you inside getting ready for dinner? Oh, and right? this, this ties in right in 23. If for, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and is not a doer, he is like a man who looks at, who looks at his natural face in the mirror... And for once he look, once he's gone away, he essentially forgets what he looks like. Yeah. So twenty that tied perfectly in twenty three and twenty four. So you basically like look at it you're like, okay, this is interesting. I see how I can apply this. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's exactly the case, right? If you hear something, you should do it. And like I was in Deuteronomy, like I'm in Deuteronomy in my personal reading, and in Deuteronomy chapter five, it talks about how you hear, and from hearing you learn, and from learning you keep, and from keeping, you do. And so hearing is ultimately supposed to produce doing. You go to the Shema, which is the most famous passage in the entire Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, Shema Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Right? You hear who God is, and as a result of hearing, this is what you do, you love him. Right? The whole thing that James is highlighting here is that if you're hearing and you're not doing, you've missed the point of hearing. 
right? And so, how is he applying that? So you talked about the imagery here, right? Yes. Yeah, like um, what, what imagery is he conveying? He's like, you're, a man looks in the mirror, and as soon as he looks away and goes and does other tasks, he forgets what it looks like. But he can always go back and look at his face, and then the cycle is just going to repeat. So that's what, because you can always go, in a way, you can always go back to scripture and reread it, right? But I can keep going back to scripture thousands and thousands of times and keep reading the same thing over and over again. And if I never apply, it's going to do me no good, and I'm just going to be caught in this constant loop. Yeah. I think it also is important that it's like it's your own face, so you should know your own face pretty well. It makes sense, you understand, but it doesn't mean you're gonna follow it. Yeah, I, you know. I think James is employing some humor with this imagery, right? What type of person looks in the mirror and then as soon as he looks away forgets what he looks like? What type of person does that? An idiot. An idiot, idiot right? Like a really stupid person. Like yeah. if you look in the mirror. And you're like, that's what I look like. And then as soon as you look away, you're like, I wonder what I look like. That means, guess what? You're going to constantly be looking back at the mirror, but never actually like, like applying the purpose of the mirror. Like the reason the mirror exists is to show you what you look like. If you look at it, and then as soon as you look away, you forget, well, you just wasted that mirror's purpose. <laughs> it's like now you're going to have to go back and do it all over again. Yeah. So what does that suggest that the purpose of scripture is? to show you what you need to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. To kind of add to your illusion, like, um, to the mirror, like, if you had something in your teeth, like, you could feel it, but then, like, or maybe you couldn't, but you looked in the mirror, you saw, oh, I got food in my teeth, and just ate, and then you turned away, and you went away, and then, like, you had to come back to show, like, oh, like, I don't know if I have food in my teeth. It's kind of like, um, when the Bible tells you, like, you look at the Bible, and it tells you that you're messed up, and then you go on, and you, like, totally forget that you're messed up, and you have to go back and yeah. yeah. Scripture is supposed to show you who you are, right? Or who you're supposed to be, right? And so as soon as you look away, and if you don't actually apply what Scripture said, it's like you've forgotten who you are or who God wants you to be. Then what was the point of studying Scripture, right? If you're just going to sit there and come to Bible study for two hours each week and not apply it, stop wasting your time. I don't know, go out and do something else. <laughs> if you're coming here, apply what it says. Um, one reason why I'm harping on this a lot is because I actually taught this to my students. We went through James um, this last school year, and at the end of it, I gave them a metal card, right, like a business card shaped thing, and it was reflective. And I etched into the metal, remember who you are, right, uh, specifically so that, and I told them to put it in their wallets um, so that when they take it out, they can see the reflection. And it's to be like, you know, you always have it with you. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. Uh, and that's actually a reference to a book that I read where um, every time the parents would leave the house before they left, the mom would say to them, remember who you are. I thought that was great. Like, that, that's how you should raise your kids up. Remember who you are and live according to that. Right. Okay. Um, so, and then I want to go into 25. Yeah. So in 25, and this is a continuing trend throughout the Bible that I love to see. So it'll say, like, for if you do this, there's going to be negative consequences, or you're like this idiot, or you're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And I also look at 25, and then you'll have a verse that ends the passage or section that goes like this. But one who intently looks at the law perfectly, the law of freedom, abides by it, not having become forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed for what he does. And also you'll see in other... Uh, and Jesus will do this. Jesus will do very, something very similar as well, continually throughout his uh, ministry. It's just fascinating to me because you'll see this with adultery. You'll be like adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, and then you'll go. But if you abide by the law and do not commit these acts and believe in me, you will inherit the kingdom of heaven. So that, that's just something fascinating that I thought was interesting. Something I love to see throughout the Bible, over and over again. What do y'all think? About verse 25. Any other thoughts, comments, questions, concerns? What does it mean to abide? Live. Live in. Live. Live it. Live it out. Yeah. And One of my favorite abide. synonyms is the word dwell. Live to dwell. To dwell. What's that? Oh, the song we sing in church? Yeah, it's a great song. Yeah. Yeah. When I read that verse, I always say freedom and liberty. Like freedom, like following the law is giving me freedom. Mm -hmm. It just sticks up to me. 
I also feel like there's a lot to unpack here, but one who I want to focus on, but one who looks intently at the perfect law. So that to me, that means like constantly looking at it, yeah. studying it, yeah. analyzing it, seeing where I am in the coordinates of God's law. Yeah. And whenever it refers to perfect law, what's it referring to? The previous verses probably kind of help us out there. God, it refers to God's law, like what other law is perfect? The Bible. Yeah, so ultimately it seems like he's using this as synonymous to God's word, right? Because the first person was not applying God's word, and then this person is looking intently at the perfect law. And so it seems like perfect law here is God's word, which also tells you like the purpose of the word, right? It is to teach us. And right. then uh, he also goes, the law of freedom, mm -hmm. and I think he's meaning that this law will set you free from sin, from the chains and the shackles of sin. Yeah. And then abides in it, and we just discussed that, that means like living it out, being doers of the word, and then having not become a forgetful here that ties in the beginning, just like listening to your surroundings and like you no know, listening to God's word and your surroundings and and, act, and in doing so as a response, act in accordance to the law. Yeah. And what will be the end result if somebody does that? At the very blessed. end, he'll be blessed for what he does. He'll be blessed. But once again, what is this all in the context of? What's the person going through? File. Hardship. File. What? But Sermon on the Mount. How does Jesus start off the whole sermon? Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are meek. the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are peacemakers. Those who is it those who mourn? mourn? Is that they shall be comforted. Right? All the things that he's saying are blessed are things that we typically wouldn't call blessed. <laughs> he's like, blessed are all the lowly people who are having a tough time in life. Because they have a good hope in the future. Right? And so James is agreeing with that. Right? Yeah, you're going through hardship. But if you follow God's word correctly, you can consider yourself blessed even in hardship, which is cool. Because blessing is nothing more than just God's provision for everything you need in life and godliness. Mm -hmm. Right? And so even in hardship, you're blessed. I also want to tie this back in the last week and how you're saying, like, how the... It was either you or Sean. You were saying that, you know, the poor have less distractions, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we have, we have careers, money house, cars, all these other things, right? And if you just look back, and for me personally, what I see is like, oh, I have all this stuff, I have, I have some money, I have a truck, I have a career going, I have a research position, scholarship, I got into the engineering program I wanted to that I thought I would never be in. And I look at all that and I'm like, oh yeah, Lord, I'm going to use it to bless somebody. And then I constantly like am doing my own thing and living my flesh. And I'm like, how have I blessed somebody today with what I have? And I'm like constantly telling God, no, 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 no. I need this to bless somebody. Yeah. Cool. Want to move on to the next verses? Let's roll. Yep. All right. Um, I'll read for us. All right. Work. All right. If anyone thinks himself to be religious while not bridling his tongue, but deceiving his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Well, he's basically talking about someone, and from what I can tell, if when he's talking about if anyone thinks himself to be religious, he's like thinking he's better than everyone else because he's religious, he's bragging, he's kind of like the Pharisees in a way while not bridling his own tongue and deceiving his own heart. Again, this is more like the Pharisees. The Pharisees were like out in the um, city streets going, Lord, 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 just trying to grab attention and pretend to be religious or what give you. And then they're not bridling their own tongue. They're constantly like calling out Jesus. They're constantly like hacking down on other people. They're constantly taxing and not living out and being doers and followers of the law. He's saying their religion is worthless. So essentially, you could look at a Pharisee and say his religion is worthless. If you look at verse 26. Yep. Yeah. So, back in, in this context, and there's still people to this day who still view things this way. Um, what did people think would be the end result of being a devout religious person? Person. 
What's that? Blessings by God. Good stuff, right? Yeah, they would think blessings would follow. But the way they define blessings is different than how James defines it, right? James just said that you can be blessed in the midst of hardship. But that's not how they viewed it, right? Uh, you see this in the book of Job, right? Remember, Job is suffering, and what do his friends immediately think? You did something wrong. Oh, you must have done something wrong. Like, if things are going badly, you must have sinned. And he's like, guys, I did it. And he spends like 40 chapters, like, <laughs> being like, guys, I did it. And you would think that maybe the people of Israel would have learned from the book of Job, but even Jesus' apostles, whenever they walk by this blind guy in the Gospel of John, what do they immediately say? He must have done something terrible. He's yeah, they say, yeah, who was it who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? <laughs> so even the followers of Jesus, what did they seem to think about being religious? That he, that he yeah. must have done something wrong. Yeah, if you were faithful, you should be blessed in this world. And if you're not faithful, then things are going hard for you, right? And so James, throughout this whole time, is saying, count it joy when you face hardship. Well, that's kind of just changing your whole perspective on things, right? Because they're like, wait a second, I thought hardship meant that I was not being faithful to God. He's like, oh, no. God will put a faithful person through hardship because maybe he's wanting to see how you handle it, right? Over here, now he con he's contrasting it, right? This last person he just said, yeah, you can be blessed even in hardship. you got to change your definition of blessing. On the other hand, if anyone thinks himself to be religious while not bridling his tongue, but it's even his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Right? So if you're not going through any trials at all, and you think that, you know, you're doing just fine on your own, maybe you need to examine yourself again. Right? That's ultimately what he's getting at here. Uh, if you are literally using your physical circumstances to kind of figure out whether or not you're good before God, um, you probably need to figure out a new way to figure to uh, determine your spiritual status because that's not a, um, a good measure. Because Jesus himself, uh, he was murdered by people and he was faithful. The apostles have currently been scattered despite being faithful. Uh, and so if you think that you're good before God because you're living a blessed life, maybe, don't want to rule it out, but maybe not. Uh, on the other hand, what does he say is true religion? And then this does yeah. the same trend I was talking about yeah. earlier. Mm -hmm. And he says, pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unsustained by the world. So essentially to keep, I'm going to kind of go backwards, mm -hmm. and to keep, so when I read, and to keep oneself uns uns unsustained by the world, it's basically going back to what Paul said about not conforming to the pattern of this world mm -hmm. and like living differently and how uh, again how other believers uh, should take note of that that part of it is very repetitive to me and i feel it's a very important point considering he's hitting it again and again and again yeah and when you say to visit orphans and widows in their affliction he's saying like give to the poor give to the needy you know care for your brother mm -hmm. in a way and then appear on the file of religion He's basically describing like the kind of he's basically saying this is the religion God wants. Yeah, it's also worth highlighting that James does not have a problem with the word religion. Um, obviously, he didn't use the English word religion. He's writing in Greek, but this is a good translation. Nowadays, a lot of Christians they don't like the word religion. They think it's like a bad word, and they're like, "No, we're not a religion." Yeah, we are. Um, but go type in Google religion definition. Christianity fits the bill, right? <laughs> we're a religion. Um, but the question is, like, what he is highlighting is the same thing that people highlight whenever they say we're not a religion, we're a relationship. He's highlighting the same exact thing, right? There are people who are religious, but that doesn't mean they're faithful to God, right? This is what we want to be. We want a pure and undefiled religion, and he gives two things that we need to do, right? What are the two things? Visit the poor, like help care for their needs, mm -hmm. and then to not... Uh do the things that the world does, like, you know, follow the pattern of the world, like Joseph was saying. Okay. Um, so maybe we should spend some time breaking those down, uh, mainly because um, there's a lot of churches that they'll just, like, open up a widows and orphans ministry, and they're like, all right, as long as we have a widows and orphans ministry, we're good before God. I would actually argue that doing that <laughs> is exactly missing the point of what James is saying, because then you're just trying to check off boxes. And that's what verse 26 people are doing. We want to be verse 27 people. So let's maybe break those down each. You, you already kind of broke them both down, but let's maybe open it up, right? Um, 
visit orphans and widows in their affliction. What is he ultimately getting at there? He's basically saying like comfort them during their hardest and most difficult times. Okay, but well, why widows and orphans? Why does he say like add, comfort rich people in their hardest? Well, What's that? Not have many other people around. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the most uh, vulnerable, most vulnerable, most neglected, and of course everybody wants to be friends with a rich guy. Who doesn't? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you, like, you know, if if some celebrity came knocking at your door and was like, hey, could I have a place to stay tonight? We're not going to turn him down, right? <laughs> we're like, yeah, absolutely. And then we're going to, like, be, like, tweeting out, oh, my gosh, guess who's staying here? <laughs> like, we'd let everybody know, right? Um, but why, why, maybe we can actually explore that. Why is it we would let everybody know if a celebrity came knocking at our door? Because they're, you know, they are considered in the world to in the world to be famous. Okay, so why is it we want everybody to know that they're at our house? Because it makes us look some, like somehow we're important. Yeah, yeah, it makes us look important. We gain something from it. It shows our pride, like, oh, I have... It shows our pride, right? Um, we're not actually even there for the celebrity, are we? We're actually there because we realize that they offer something to us and we want to use it and abuse it and use it for our own personal gain. So even in taking care of the celebrity, we're not actually doing it for them. We're doing it for ourselves. Mm. On the other hand, if a widow and an orphan just came knocking at our door, we'd probably be less inclined to just jump at it. And if we did open the door, I doubt that we'd be taking selfies with them and posting it everywhere. Why is that? Well, actually, some people do. They do that for attention. They're like, oh, what Oh, you mean whenever people go on, like, a what? mission trip? Oh, and, oh, yeah. oh, well, in a way, yes. I mean... I try not to do that when I, like, go on this. Like, I'll post about, like, cliff jumping or whatever, Uh but, like, like, I sent y'all pictures, and I just want to keep y'all up to date, but, like, I'm not posting on Snapchat, like, oh, nailing another, uh, putting in another nail on the roof for God. Yes. Like, that kind of thing. Yeah. You're not being a Pharisee sitting on the street corner being like, look at me! (laughs) Yeah, no, no, I wasn't, I wasn't doing any of that. Yeah. The reason why he says... Pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction is because these are people who have nothing to offer you. Right? Uh, Jesus talks about this once again in the Sermon on the Mount. Right? If you only love those who love you, you're not doing anything more than what tax collectors and Gentiles will do. Mm-hmm. Everybody does that. Right? It's easy to love somebody who already loves you. It's easy to want to help somebody out if you gain something from helping them out. But orphans and widows, by their very nature, and this is more, you understand this more back in their culture. Nowadays, if a person is widowed, like, women can just go out and, you know, get their own job or something like that. Back in this day, if a woman's husband dies, she's probably destitute for her whole life unless somebody steps in and helps. But that also means that she has nothing to offer them if they do step in and help. Right? And so if you actually help out a widow or an orphan, it is just out of the kindness of your heart. And so, basically, he's saying God sees that. Because you're sacrificing everything. They have nothing to offer you in return. And so that's genuine love. Yeah. right? It's kind of like the um, whole thing with uh, Socrates talking about the perfect man. Have I ever told you about that? Um, this is like hundreds of years before Jesus. Um, actually, it wasn't Socrates. I think Plato like quoted somebody talking about this. Um, it's in like, the Republic. Uh, basically, this one philosopher was asked, like, how would you know that a perfect person existed? right? A perfectly just man. And the way the person responded is like, well... The only way that you know that the person was actually just is if they spent their entire life doing the right thing, but their entire life they were despised and rejected by everybody and ultimately were like marched down the street and crucified. Uh, And they usually, it literally says crucified. Like it does say like, had your eyes plucked out as well. And then it says, and only in that person's death would you know that they were just. And the reason why is because if you receive a reward for your good actions, then people might, there's always the possibility that you were doing it for the reward. However, if you are a perfectly good person, even unto death, well then, once you die, everybody's going to know, oh wow, that was a good guy. (laughs) And that's how that guy talked about it, like 400 years before Jesus even showed up, which is pretty crazy. But James is hitting that same point, right? Pure and undefiled religion is the person who seeks to serve somebody without the promise of anything in return. Well, it's funny how you say that, because... People nowadays would say, "Oh yeah, Joseph's not that great. He does this. He does that." But I, but if I like die tomorrow, everybody's gonna be at my funeral going, "Oh, he was such a great guy. He was <laughs> compassionate. He was yeah. caring. Oh, he helped me do this." Mm-hmm. 
I just kind of find, <laughs> find it funny how that works. Yes. The irony of the world. I see that. And so, um, there's also this idea of you're not looking down on the orphans and the widows, right? Because sometimes that's how people look at it, right? Oh, if you've been orphaned and widowed, then either, like, somebody in your family was sinning. <laughs> and and therefore, maybe we shouldn't take care of you. And he's like, no. Take care of them. Right? Uh, were you going to say something? I was going to comment that they think, like, sin is contagious. And if you associate yourself with a sinner, it's going to be contagious and you're going to sin. But you look at Jesus and he hung out with sinners. Did he conform to their pattern? No. no. Which leads to the second part, right? The not conforming. It's so or, vido, visiting widows and orphans in their affliction, but also keeping yourself unstained by the world. Um, why do you think he brings that up here? Because I would actually argue that the Pharisees, they thought that they were keeping themselves unstained by the world. Right? Well, they were right in it because they were like receiving a reward for their quote-unquote worship in the street corner. Mm-hmm. They were looking good on the outside, but on the inside they were evil at heart. They were dirty, like the grave, you know, like full of dead men's bones. Yeah. That's the irony of the Pharisees, right? They took pride in the fact that they were so unstained by the world that they were living holy lives despite the fact that everybody else was not. But it's the things that they valued that demonstrated that they had been stained by the world, right? Because the thing that they took pride in is how good they looked before other people (laughs) <laughs> because they were living holy lives, right? It was an entirely self-serving thing. And they looked at the material blessings they'd received as a result of being holy, righteous people, and they were like, ha, see? We've been blessed by God. Whereas James is saying, if that's what you value, then you've missed what God values. Because God doesn't, I mean, material blessings are fine, but that's not the thing that God values as much. He values showing love and showing mercy and upholding justice. Right? That's what he values, and the Pharisees, they perverted that, and they just followed the letter of the law to such a degree that it resulted in blessings for themselves, which showed that they actually valued the blessings in a physical sense, not as much faithfulness to God. Whereas James is saying, don't care about the riches and the wealth, care about the faithfulness. If you can be faithful to God, that is the true blessing. Right? That is what you should be seeking out, and that can happen whether you're rich or poor. Right? But if you're looking at rich like rich people and just being like, ah, that's how you know you've been faithful. No. Right? And so you have to be unstained by the world, which means that you have to get rid of the world's value system and basically unlearn it. Right? Um, maybe the greatest like, – like, even think about how we talk about this sometimes. Right? God really blessed me um, by allowing me to get promoted at work so now I make more money. Maybe. That could be a blessing, but not necessarily – Right? We immediately assume more money equals God is blessed me. Or God has just introduced a great trial into your path. Right? Uh, that promotion and that extra money, it could be a blessing from God. And he's saying, you know what? You've been doing such a great job. Here, I'll allow, you, I'll allow you to have some more money. Or it could be God introducing a trial to test to see whether or not you'll be faithful with that extra money. Right? And so, but we immediately assume, oh, that's a blessing. Because we... Have adopted that Pharisaical well, mindset also, unintentionally. Well, also comment about the money, and like once you get in a good place in your life, like and for for all of us, that's a different definition. For me, that would be like a house, a loving wife, and maybe a couple kids. I haven't decided how many kids I want yet. Right, but aside, okay, aside from that, <laughs> aside, from that <laughs> aside from that, let's say I'm there. I'm an engineer. I have a loving wife and maybe three kids. And I'm making, I don't know, let's say, I'm making enough to, I'm not going to give an exact number, I'm just going to say I'm making enough to make my mortgage payments, my cars are paid off, and I get a promotion. But yet, before that promotion, I was living just fine. When I, when I look at that extra money, I should be like, I shouldn't be like, oh, now I can go buy like a nicer car, or I can go buy, or I can like afford a nice vacation for me and my wife, or what give you is like, we should not increase our standard of living. We should increase our standard of giving. Yeah. One more practical thing, then we can probably move on. Um, in our world nowadays, whenever we refer to a successful church, what do we typically mean? Build pews. Build pews. Yeah. Why is that? <laughs> Looks good. Well, it's because that's what we value, right? We view success as greater numbers. However, um, 
Well, how many people were following Jesus after his resurrection? Like, how many people were gathered in the upper room? Not many. Well, there, there were 12 at the, the upper room during the, um, the Last Supper. But specifically, like, afterwards, like, whenever the um, Holy Spirit descended, how many people? 120. 120 people were gathered. Well, that's crazy because a few months earlier, well, about a year earlier, Jesus had preached a sermon and fed 5,000 men plus women and children at the same time. That's like 20,000 people. But you're saying that like a year later, only 120 people were gathered? Well, honestly, if you just go to the next day after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus runs off most of those people. Um, from a modern church perspective, Jesus was the worst pastor ever. He literally preached a sermon, and over the course of the sermon, by the sermon's end, most of the people had got up and left. Imagine if that happened in a church service nowadays. You started off the service with 20,000 people, and then by the end, there's like a dozen. <laughs> people would be like, yeah, not a good pastor. Because we oftentimes define success by a worldly standard. However, some of the most successful churches I've seen are really small churches, right? Because if you're judging success by faithfulness, it's actually a little bit easier to be faithful to God in a smaller church. I'm not saying it's impossible in a bigger church, but I'm just saying that even the language we use to refer to churches shows that maybe we haven't arrived at pure and undefiled religion yet because we still judge things by earthly standards. And we think, okay, if the goal of a concert is to sell out, then the goal of a church should be to fill the pews. Now, if our goal to fill the pews is because we want everybody to believe in the gospel, amen, let's fill the pews. But our goal should not be to simply fill the pews. Our goal should be to be faithful to God and let God decide whether or not the pews are filled. Well, also, another reason some mega churches fail in the spiritual perspective is that they just preach what the people want to hear. And that's because their main goal is to fill the pews, right? They've lost sight of being faithful, and they've made their primary focus, and they'll justify it, right? Well, our goal is to make everybody hear the gospel and everybody to believe. But they'll lessen it, and you have to realize that God hasn't appointed every single church to be a giant church, right? He has appointed every church to be faithful, and that's what he's called us all to be. And if you make it your goal to be a giant church whenever God didn't want you to be a giant church, well, then now you're being unfaithful, right? But we judge success in the wrong way sometimes because we value things as the world does. So I'm mainly just highlighting that just to show you how even though the words are right there, we have still failed to apply this in our own lives. And it says to stay unstained by the world, but we haven't done that. And you see it in the very language we use. We think, wow, that was a successful service because everybody showed up that week. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing for more people to show up. I've been so encouraged at our church because more people have been showing up. But the reason I've been encouraged is because that hasn't been our goal. Like there has never been a single time where I've sat down with Pastor Rob or Luke and been like, all right, what can we do to fill the seats? That's never happened. Instead, our goals, let's just be faithful every Sunday. And then all of a sudden people are showing up. That's encouraging to me because we haven't sacrificed anything in order to do it. Whereas at other churches I've been at, we have so many discussions. How do we get people to be in here? And it would drive me nuts, right? I just wanted to highlight that because it's stuff that we need to be mindful of. When he says staying unstained by the world, he means stuff like that, right? Valuing things the world values. Because um, there is a righteousness that looks righteous from the outside that the Pharisees had. Um, that's not what we're going for. It's a righteousness before God. All right, sorry. End of rant. Um, shall we go into chapter two? <laughs> yeah, <it's okay. laughs> so just, it's something I'm passionate about. All right. Um, all right, all right. So, do you want me to read it, or do you want to read it? Go ahead. All right. My brothers, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in bright clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the bright clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there right, or sit by the footstool. Can you stop at four? There's a, just a lot to unpack yeah, right there. that's fine. Me. Yeah. So when I read two, when I read one through about three... It's showing, it's about showing favoritism, right? It's like, you know, a wealthy man comes in, you're like, oh, sit here in the high place, and the poor man, you're like, oh, you can just sit here on the floor, dude, whatever. And how I think of that is like, you know, if we're an average person, right, we're obviously, socially speaking and economically speaking, we're at a higher position than the poor man and a lower position than the wealthy man. 
And if we were to truly follow the scripture, we should be self-sacrificing. So we should like maybe give the poor man our seat at the church service, at the church service, study, whatever. And um, the wealthy man, if he wants to, you should just offer him a seat. You don't have to necessarily offer him the nice place. You can be like, welcome in, dude, sit where you like. And if he chooses the highest seat, so be it. And if he just decides to sit on the floor or at a normal seat, then so be it. But you're not like specifically offering that seat to him to show like, hey, you're the most valuable person here. I really like you and I want to be close to you and be friends with you. That's why I'm going to give you the highest seat. That's coming from a place of pride, ego, and you're going to get something out of that. So. That's all I have to say about one through three. Any thoughts? It also shows the people looking on the outside and not the inside. Mm -hmm. That too. You can continue, David, if you want. I'm sorry. I just oh, no, you're good. wanted to blurb. Um, I'm going to read through verse 4 real quick also, and then I want to say something about that. Okay. Um, so he talks about this whole thing in verses 1 through 3, right? And basically he's giving an example, right? Um, he says, okay, two people walk in. One dude, evidently rich. One dude, evidently poor. And you... As a person who's leading the church, you guide the poor person to sit at one place, you guide the rich person to sit at another place, and you're obviously showing favoritism to the rich person. And he comes to a conclusion about a person who does something like this. Have you not made distinctions amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? I have another thought on that, too. When you do that, you're taking away judgment that is God's. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah, because ultimately, who is the final judge of all things? God. God. Um, but what is he saying by all that? And this is a pretty strong thing to say to somebody. Um, go ahead, go ahead, Rocky. I would say, uh, you're talking about verse 4, right? Yeah. We're not supposed to be judges. Mm -hmm. God's supposed to be the judge. Okay. That's exactly what I was going to say. It was, it was saying that, uh, because you're, you are know, you're talking about, uh, people having favoritism, you're basically judging others is by the, their actions. Is the favoritism the evil thought? Is favoritism the evil thought? Yeah. I would say in this context, um, so favoritism is the evil act, I think, and the thoughts are the things that lead to the favoritism. Right? Because ultimately, you've got to answer the question, because he's, he's saying that apparently this favoritism you're exercising is a judgment on your end, right? You have judged between these two people. And that is because you have these evil thoughts on the inside that are simply expressing themselves in how you're treating the people. So the question is, what are the evil thoughts? What is leading the person to what, make this distinction? What I would think, and this also kind of goes full circle, is like, I'm putting this person in this high place because maybe you know they'll give a good donation to my church or my ministry, and then therefore, because this person came, it's gonna go full circle, and. God blessed me. He gave me money. He gave money to my ministry. And in reality, it's just me showing favoritism and putting a wealthy person in a high place or at the high or at the high seat at my table. Okay. Yeah. So I think there is that aspect because that returns to what we were talking about with the previous verses, right? Yes. It's, it's like, like the idea of receiving something. Like you're basically using people for your own personal gain. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there is that aspect for sure. What else? What other evil thoughts might be lurking behind this favoritism? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, God created all of us with a purpose. Like, he's the one, he's the author of our life. He's the one who gives us a purpose. And so for you, this, for when he says, have you not made the distinctions among yourself? Um, I think that he's saying, <clears throat> sorry, and become judges with evil thoughts. I think that he's saying, like, you are putting, like, a purpose of your own into that person. Like, you're projecting something that they're not even created for. Mm -hmm. A poor person may be a blessing just like a rich person would be a blessing, just not in the way that you intend it to be. Yeah. It's not your story to write for them. True. Very true. Were you saying something, George? Uh, yeah, is it identification? That like poor person, the person, the rich poor. Yeah. Yeah. Does that matter? Um, real quick. Who can name me some, um, there's off the top of your head, who are some celebrities who are just known for being Christians? 
Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt. Yeah. What else? Billy um, Zimmerman. Can't remember. Country singer. Okay, I don't think I know who that is. Kanye West. Oh, yeah, Kanye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a little bit. It's controversial. <laughs> there. Probably, I think I know who that well, is. Well, no, I mean, there, that was a big thing. Okay, actually, that's, that's, a, that's a really good example. I actually, I actually looked at that service yeah. out of Joel's Yeah. Church. Well, let's go with the Kanye thing real quick. Let's roll with this. Kanye. I remember whenever Kanye, like, like the, that whole thing happened, right? He, like, released, like, the Jesus is King album stuff. I'm not a rap person, so it really did not shake up my world at all. But so many Christians hopped on, and they're like, man, I remember on Instagram, everybody's stories were filled with it. Like, oh my gosh, Kanye came to Christ. And, uh, and then, like, literally, people are giving Kanye this platform to talk about Jesus. And he'd get up there, and honestly, you could tell that, like, even, like I, don't know what, I don't know where his heart's at. I don't know enough about Kanye West to make a judgment there. But you could tell from listening to him that he wasn't ready to be speaking publicly about this stuff. Right? He just didn't. He wasn't well versed enough in what Christianity was. <laughs> like he was up there. But my question to you is this: Why did we give him a big platform? He's famous. He's Every, famous. Everybody wanted. Everybody and their mother wanted him in their church. <laughs> yeah. Why is it that we know all these celebrities off the top of our heads? And you know, we, we get so excited, right? I I can't tell you how many times. Once again, just pull up social media. And you'll see that, like, you know, Chris Pratt gave a speech, and he mentioned Jesus one time in there. And everybody's like, oh, I'm going to share that, I'm going to share that, I'm going to share that. But where's, the, like, all the people sharing stories about, I don't know, some poor, no-named person at their church who has been faithful to Jesus throughout all their suffering? Well, all of a sudden, their name, like, we just don't think about them that much, right? I mean, we might talk with them, and we might be really encouraged by talking with them and having this great conversation but we don't go publicly sharing that. And, you know, then we'll justify it. We'll be like, well, the reason why we're so happy isn't just because it's a celebrity who's a Christian. It's actually just because I'm so encouraged by the fact that Jesus is getting proclaimed so publicly in front of everybody from this platform. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, or maybe it's because you're like, oh my gosh, if a celebrity can be a Christian, maybe there's hope <laughs> to where... We look at celebrities, and that's who we idolize. And so whenever we see that one of these celebrities actually holds the same beliefs as us, we're like, wow. See, guys, we're not crazy. And so we start sharing it because we idolize these people. And what we're doing is this. We're becoming judges of evil thoughts. To be fair, the only reason you heard that Chris Pratt was a Christian is because he had a platform and therefore the name of Jesus did get preached. And I'm not saying those are bad things. I'm just saying that the delight that we feel in our hearts whenever a Christian slightly mentions Jesus, even though their theology might be super shaky, <laughs> if they just mention the name of Jesus, just two syllables, man, we will just go tell everybody about it. Whereas you can talk to a homeless person who's been faithful their entire life and they have never reaped a single benefit from it. You know, we won't mention it to anybody. I think that's on us. And I'm not saying I don't do the same thing. I get excited about it. But man, like, I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a movie, and I would really like the like, people acting in it, and I'll go on Wikipedia and just go to the personal belief section and just like, be like, oh, are they a Christian? Oh, dang it. I'm guilty of it. But why? Like, why is it that I care so much about them and not the person I just smiled to walking down the street? You know? Why is it that I care so much whether or not celebrity A, B, and C are going to end up in heaven, but I don't feel that same tenderness and compassion towards, you know, person checking out next to me at Kroger? Why is that? And I'm, once again, I'm not saying I apply this perfectly. I'm just allowing James to convict me as well. Um, this might be a little controversial. But, go for um, it. <laughs> <laughs> it's alright, it's too controversial but, but, The door's really close Okay, It's not like politically <laughs> controversial Just kind of A thought So think about somebody that's wronged you, right? Have you ever thought that like Oh, they wronged me I don't like them God's going to judge them one day What about that person? Do you hope they go to heaven? Or do you hope they get judged because of what they did to you? I mean, they're going to get them judged regardless, but I still hope they go to I hope they barely escape the flames. We're all going <laughs> to be judged one day. Yeah. But the judgment, if we 
if we've accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, went on Jesus, but we're still going to be yeah. judged for what we did. Yeah. I just want to add one thing. Mm -hmm. um, just reading the verses, a couple of verses ahead, it also seems like maybe the evil thoughts, I, mean, I don't know how important it is to the text, but like it specifically says that God chose the poor of the world to be rich in faith, whereas the rich are blaspheming the good name. It also seems like this idea of calling what God calls good like evil and calling what God calls evil good. Yeah. So it's well, yeah, it is literally just a role reversal because he's obviously not condemning every like he's making a broad blanket statement, and there's always going to be exceptions, right? He's not saying that every rich person is going to hell and every poor person is going to heaven. He's just saying that in general, God doesn't value things the same. And so whenever we inherently value rich people over poor people, we are flipping the system. And we're saying what God calls good, we call evil. And what God calls evil, we call good. Um, which is what we've been guilty of ever since the Garden of Eden. Um, and it's kind of what the world does. Yeah. No, oh, exactly. Yeah. So we are actually being worldly in our judgment, even within the church. Uh, and that's really what he's criticizing. Like, you can realize <laughs> everything James is saying here is not supposed to be easy to apply. It's like very difficult teachings. Uh, but maybe we should go to verses 5 through 7 because I realize that it's late and we still have. Okay. We're going to get to verse 13. All right. Let's hit it. Yes. Listen, my beloved brothers. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom of heaven, which he promised him? Again, that's kind of like flipping the table, just broad perspective. But you who have dishonored the poor man, it's not the rich who oppress you. They are themselves who drag you. Are they themselves who drag you to court? Do they not blaspheme the isn't that blasphemy, the good name by which you have been called? Okay, what he's saying here is he's like calling them out. He's like, look, these guys don't like you anyway. So why are you like honoring them and giving them high seats and all this praise? Like, even from a worldly perspective, they haven't even earned your grace. You guys are just idiots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how James just rolls. <laughs> He's just like, guys, like, let's just think this logic through. Like, you know that they say, like, don't meet your heroes? There's a reason they say that. It's because you spend your entire life idolizing them, and then you meet them, and you realize that they're just jerks. <laughs> like, like, you're like, wow, this celebrity is so amazing, and you're like, can I have an autograph? And they're like, I don't have time for you. You're like, oh. Wow. And then, like, all of a sudden, your all your hopes and dreams come crashing down because you formed this person into some, like, unbelievable, perfect idol when, like, in reality, the rich people, they're the ones who drag you to court. <laughs> they're like, yeah. you dinged my Lamborghini. Have fun in jail. It's like, okay. Um, yeah. Um, what, what do y'all have to think or say about that stuff? In a way, he's kind of saying, like, what have the poor done to you? Whereas the rich, they just keep, like, causing problems in your lives. Yeah. Well, specifically as believers of faith, because most of the wealthy people back then were like persecuting Christians at the time, right? So. Um, I mean, if anybody was persecuted, like the people who were persecuting, they probably have to be on the wealthier end. What he's pointing out is that poor people, they don't have access to resources. To, like, like, they don't have access to the resources necessary to make your life miserable. <laughs> like, they're so focused on just trying to make it through their life, they're not really out there to try to make yours worse. And Whereas rich people, you know... They have got, they got free and, and, and again, and again, this is like a really broad statement. Yes, you could have a poor person who like tries to heckle you on the street and then accuses you of like salt or something, and then he makes you like hell by dragging you to court, even if nothing comes of it. But then you could also have like the rich man who well who doesn't really heckle you, right? Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Yeah. And another thing that Sean highlighted here um, last week is that it's easy to look at this, and whenever we think the rich man, what are we typically thinking in our heads? Like, whenever, we, whenever I say rich, what do you typically think oh, of? Oh, is this like going back to last week? Yeah. Know, we think of Elon Musk. We think of mansions. We think of Lamborghinis. We think of all the fancy stuff. And so whenever we read this, uh, it's very easy for us to think that we don't belong to either of these categories, right? We're like the, uh, we're the faithful category right in the middle that doesn't belong to either of the negative things, right? We're not poor, but we're not rich, right? We're, we're the ones in the middle that he doesn't mention. We're the ones who are actually faithful, right? That's who we, that's what we like to consider ourselves. But who are we actually, according well, to James? If you look at 
if you look at the perspective the of the world, and like the economy of the U.S. compared to everything else, we're actually pretty dang wealthy. We're like in the top 15, 10%. Yeah, and yeah. you got to realize that in general, the world nowadays, compared to the world back then, I mean, the poor people of the world nowadays are not too far away from the rich people of the world back in like the first century A.D. Uh, because typically, like especially if you're living in Israel, what did it mean to be rich? Yeah, I mean, just, like, you didn't have to worry about, like, life as much, right? Yeah, there'd be people out there with big houses and stuff, and usually those people were the ones who would host the churches, right? But it was people who knew where the next meal was coming from. It was the people who didn't have to live from meal to meal, right? Those are the rich people. And so as we read through this, whenever James is coming out so harsh against the rich, you have to realize that that's us. Like, so we don't have the luxury of, like, there's a lot of luxuries we do have in this world. <laughs> and that's his whole point. Because uh, we do not have the luxury of being like, oh, those dang rich people. No, we are the rich. Um, and we need to take this, these things and process it. And yes, there are the other more rich people, like the Chris Pratt's and the Kanye's, mm-hmm. that we look at and we're like, wow. But you've got to realize that those, those are well beyond what he's talking about here. Right? He's not talking about the emperors of his time period. He's talking about just the wealthier citizens, right? We fall into that category, right? So just keep that in mind. When he talks about the rich people, that's stuff we're supposed to take to heart and apply. We're the ones who sue people and drag them to court. It's just how it is. Poor people don't have that luxury. Um, They're like, no, you know what? I, I don't have time for this. I need to go out and work for my family just to make sure they have a meal. I don't, like, yeah, you might have wronged me. If I had the luxury and the free time to take you to court and the money, I probably would, but I got to provide for my family, so I'll just bear the shame and move on, right? There's a difference there. All right, let's move to these final verses. Go for it. Okay. However, if you are fulfilling the royal law according to scripture, quote unquote, you shall love one, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, close quote, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin, being convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law, yet stumbles at one singular point, he has, he has become guilty of it all. For he who said, quote unquote, do not commit adultery, close quote, also said, open quote, do not commit murder, close quote, now if you do not commit adultery, but murder, you have become a transgressor, also vice versa works. So. So speak and act as to those who are being judged by the law of freedom, meaning God's law. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. All right. So what do you all think? Listening to what you read, uh, even if you do the smallest thing, it's like you did the worst thing. One thing. I'm curious to get y'all's thoughts on this. So do you think God judges all sin the same? Like, just out of curiosity. No. I agree with Rocky. Do you think God judges, like, every single sin? Sin is still sin, but I think some sins are worse off than others. But sin is still sin, though. Sin is still sin, yes. Like, as far as worldly consequences, like, if I keep a undersized, like, if I keep an oversized red drum versus me killing somebody... I mean, world, the worldly consequences are uh, quite different, but how do you think God feels that? Use I think, that? I think he judges them the same. I, I know there's the unforgivable sin, and then there's sin, but he still judges them the same. So I guess what another I mean, way to word this... Oh, sorry, go for it. No, oh, I was just going to say what I mean by that is, like, he's not going to say you're half guilty. He's going to say you're guilty. You're guilty. So the question ultimately we're getting at is, are all sins equal? Yes. Why do you say that? Does it? Where does it say that? For if you've committed adultery, it's all the same. It says if you commit adultery but not murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Yeah, does that mean that all sins equal? You still get the same punishment. All leads to death if you don't have Jesus. Well, everybody dies. Yeah. You get separation from Jesus if you don't have 
his blood and wash over your sin. So is that the only thing that happens though? So you're saying like Hitler, and then like contrast, you got like Hitler over here on one side, and then you got another dude who was honestly a relatively decent person their entire life, but like they died not believing in Jesus. Are they going to face the exact same consequences? Yes. 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 I I will say that they will both be going to hell. But you've got to realize that there's punishment, right? You're right, you're right? Like, so all sins are equal, but also all sins are not equal, right? All sins are equal in the sense of whether you initiated the Holocaust or stole a piece of bubble gum, both of those are sinful, and therefore they separate you from God, right? But when it comes to the final judgment, obviously there is a distinction to be made, right? Um, the person who initiated the Holocaust is probably going to be facing a lot more judgment than the person who just stole the gun. And I don't, I'm not saying that I know how that's going to look, right? The Bible, honestly, doesn't spend that much time talking about it because if you're reading the Bible correctly and you're hearing it and applying it, you're not going to end up there, right? And so the Bible is actually very quiet on exactly the dynamics of what hell looks like, right? It doesn't talk a lot about it. But God do, it does say that God will reward each person according to what they have done, yeah. right? And so people will stand before God, and there will be judgments, right? And those who are righteous and those who believed in him, they will receive rewards, right? So there's the people who go to heaven, the people who go to hell, right? But then there's actual recounting of what they have done on earth, right? And there will be rewards and punishments based off of that, right? And so if your main goal is to simply get into like the main reason I'm highlighting this is because if you view all sins as being equal and you just leave it there, then you're going to view all faith as being equal at the same time, right? Because you're basically, at that point, your whole goal is to simply not go to hell. Well, no. Like, you also want to be faithful to God, right? And so if your goal is to simply not go to hell, well, okay, well, just like, I guess, believe in Jesus and just like do the bare minimum, right? Like, just like, I don't know, just make sure that in some way you're just like exercising faith without growing. I don't know. Like, the whole point is that there is motivation to live for God, right? right? If you have faith in Him, you will live for Him. And um, I'm not saying that your goal should be to earn rewards. I'm just pointing out that, biblically speaking, there is a distinction to be made, right? And I just know that that was something that people mistaught that to me whenever I was younger. Like, as a little kid, they would always say, all sin is equal. And I understand what they were getting at there because they were just trying to highlight that any sin, like just one sin, the smallest sin, is enough to separate you from God. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, amen, that is true. But it also goes further than that. Like whenever Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I say to you, he who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery. He's not saying that those two sins are equal. He's just saying that sin does not begin when you commit adultery. The sin began whenever you looked on a woman with lust. But God looks at those two sins, and I think, like, if God is a God of truth and justice... Inevitably, the man who actually engaged in physical adultery, everybody can agree, has done something worse than simply gazing at an attractive woman for a little too long, right? Like, just objectively, one is worse than the other. Jesus is highlighting that we shouldn't simply be satisfied with avoiding the extreme sin. No, we need to look for even the smallest sins, and we need to get rid of even the gazes, right? So that's ultimately what uh, I just want to highlight there, because sometimes people misunderstand that. Um, anyways, back to you. I just wanted to address that because it's a misconception all the times. Okay, that's kind of the reason I brought it up. I just wanted to see where everybody was. Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to start from the top. If you, however, are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture and say, quote unquote, you shall love yourself, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. So he's saying, like, if you're loving other people as you want yourself to be loved or loving yourself, you're doing well, you're doing good. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin. So basically, if you're saying, like, oh, I'm going to put this person in this category because he's poor, I don't like him, and this person in this category because he's rich, and I want to be buddy-buddy with him, then that's a sin, and you are convicted by the law, and you are transgressors. Yeah. Then it goes on to say, and he even further exaggerates this and kind of puts, like, a microscope lens on it. And he says, for whoever keeps the law... The whole law yet stumbles at one single point, like I look at a woman for too long, like I look at a, a woman in a bikini for too long, and he has become guilty of it all. So just because I look at the woman in a bikini too long, 
I'm guilty of it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Again, he's kind of highlighting that same aspect. He's like saying adultery is a lot less worse of a sin than killing somebody. But sin is sin, regardless is what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Now, if you commit adultery, but you basically route that last part, we're going back to that. We're saying, you know, you're guilty of the whole law. And he's saying, so speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of freedom. So he's saying, like, you know, if you're reading this and you're, you're reading scripture, you're applying scripture, you believe in Jesus, you believe the gospel is all the above, you're going to be judged, but, you, but you're washed by the blood of Christ. You're going to be okay at the end of the day. But act like that's not the case. Act like Jesus never, well, don't take it too literally, but in a sense, act like Jesus never came. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. I think so. No, not following? Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back, but I'll try to word it differently. Well, let, let, let's just walk through it together. Um, so, first off, how does he define fulfilling the royal law? And by royal law, what is he referring to? God's law. God's law, which is found where? In the Bible. Specifically where? First the first five books, right? The law, the Torah, right? The law given to the people of Israel. If you really want to fulfill that law, what do you have to do? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Where is that quoted at? We're, like He's quoting scripture there. What's he quoting from? I'm not looking for a specific citation. Was that, for, was that in Deuteronomy? Ultimately, what I'm getting at, he's quoting from the law, right? He is quoting one commandment from the law, and he's saying, if you obey that one commandment, you're going to fulfill the rest of them, right? Uh, which is what Jesus said, remember? Um, they said, hey, Jesus, what's the most important commandment? How did he respond? Show up the word of God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, he says, you know what? I won't give you just the one most important commandment. I'll give you the two most important commandments. And if you take these two commandments, you actually have the entire law summarized. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? And remember that one starts off with, hear, O Israel. Right? Shema, to hear. Wow, he just talked about hearing. It's almost like he was just talking about that one. And then now, the second one. Love your neighbor as yourself. The question ultimately becomes, who is your neighbor? Right? Because remember, we have somebody coming up to Jesus and asking that same question. How does Jesus respond whenever somebody says, who is my neighbor? Do you remember how he responds? Does he actually give an answer? By the way, I framed the question. Hopefully y'all can tell that the answer is no. Uh, he did not give the answer in a straightforward manner. He actually told a story. Do you remember what story he shared? Was that the parable of the unforgiven servant? Nope. The Good Samaritan. Yeah. Right? The Good Samaritan right. is the answer to who is my neighbor. The Jews and the Samaritans did not like each other. This one Samaritan comes across a Jew who has been beaten up and left for dead, and he helps him. Kind of like visiting an orphan and a widow in their affliction, right? The Samaritan sees this guy who would typically hate him. This guy has nothing to offer him, yet he helps him. Right? He makes no distinction. Like He wasn't like, oh, well, you're not wealthy. You're not a Samaritan. No, he helps him. Right? Same thing. Right? So he says, if you're fulfilling the royal law by um, loving your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. Good job. However, if you think that you're fulfilling that law while also showing favoritism, you might need to look at yourself again. Because I think that you've made a distinction that the Bible does not allow. Right? Because whenever the scripture said, love your neighbor, it'd be easy for the Israelites to think, oh, well, my neighbor are the people of Israel. But then there's also a lot of laws in the Torah that command you to love the nation surrounding you and to help other people out and to help slaves out and to help the oppressed and the widows and the orphans. Well, it seems like, according to the Torah, the definition of neighbor is a lot broader than simply the Israelite to my left and right. It's people, it's people in general. Everybody is your neighbor. And another image bearer of God that you encounter in your day-to-day -day life, that is your neighbor. And according to the Torah, you have to love them as you love yourself. Well, how do I love myself? Well, basically, I spend most of every living, waking breath trying to figure out how to provide for myself throughout the day. Um, we are naturally inherently selfish people. The culture will tell you you need to learn to love yourself. Take that, take that advice, throw it in the trash. That's not it. We love ourselves enough as it is. And Jesus is like, take the love you usually give yourself and give it to somebody else for a change. Um, like, we usually 
love ourselves so much that that love turns into self-hatred because we're so <laughs> focused on ourselves that we like start getting like insecure and all that stuff and that's that ultimately gives rise to the idea of you need to love yourself more it's because you're already too self-focused <laughs> it's like no the way you love yourself better is actually by giving the love to other people right yes. and he says you can't say that you're fulfilling the law if you're being partial if you show partiality you are committing sin being convicted by the law as transgressors and then he just makes a statement about what it means to obey the law. For whoever keeps the whole law, yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. He's pointing out that some people might try to tout the righteousness, right? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I might have committed adultery a long time ago, but I never murdered somebody. And murder is worse. He says, uh, oh, still guilty before God. Also, you can tie yeah. this back like the speck in your, the spe uh, speck in your neighbor's eye versus the wall on your own. Yep. Yeah. It's like you're you're, so out, you're, out, you're out here like calling people out on their own sin, and yet you got to log in your own. Yeah, well, and because and, that's exactly what he's talking about with the partiality, right? You're looking down upon the poor person because you think that their sin was greater than your own, and that's why they are being cursed while you're being blessed, right? So, yeah, maybe you committed adultery a long time ago, or maybe you gazed at a woman with lust. And apparently that sin escaped the eyes of God, and so you are still blessed despite having lusted after that woman, whereas this person, they must have murdered somebody or something because they're poor, and they are going through that stuff. And he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh-uh. <laughs> a sin is a sin. Yes, some sins may be worse than others, but it doesn't take a grievous sin to separate you from God, right? Even if you've committed one sin. Whether it's adultery, whether it's murder, whether it's being angry at somebody for no reason, whether it is looking at a woman with lust. One sin makes you guilty of the law. That's all it takes. And so you can't look down upon another person because of their sin because you're a sinner too. Yeah. And whenever you show partiality, there's self-righteousness there. And you're saying, wow, I am choosing to value this person because I esteem them higher. Or I am choosing to devalue this person because I esteem them lower. Uh, and we're all guilty of this. And like that's what I just want to highlight this. There is not a single person in the world who is not guilty of doing the things that James is talking about here. So if you're ever reading the book of James and you're like, man, <laughs> dude next to me can really learn to apply this. All of us need to apply this, right? Because he's talking about just universal things that everybody gets wrong. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Once again, okay, Sermon on the Mount. I just have to keep referencing this. Because, like, what are the first two things, that, like, the first two examples Jesus lists in the Sermon on the Mount? Whenever he says, you have heard that it was said this, but I say this. What are the first two examples? going to, like... You can take a wild guess. Hitting, right? You can take a wild, wild guess. Uh, adultery and murder. <laughs> it's probably adultery. <laughs> Once again, I try to frame my question so that even if you don't know the answer, you can probably guess it. It's these two. Right? He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, do not murder, but I say to you, whoever is angry at his brother or calls him foolish or calls him empty-headed, he can be thrown into hell. Right? You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman with lust is guilty of adultery. Right? So Jesus, he's literally working through the law. Right? He starts with the Ten Commandments, and the first few commandments are dealing with God, but then you start getting to the ones about a relationship with man. He starts with the Sixth Commandment and the Seventh Commandment. James, he starts with the Seventh Commandment goes to the Sixth Commandment. Like, it's literally... <laughs> It's almost like him and Jesus were brothers. <laughs> it's like the same thought process. Now, if you do not commit adultery but murder, you become a transgressor of the law, right? I mean, you can pick and choose your poison. We all have our different vices. We're all guilty of different stuff. And you might be tempted to look at another person as worse off than you because, you know, you simply didn't make restitution for that ox that you stole, whereas they murdered 30 people. And you might look down on them and be like, whoa, you're terrible. Yeah, they might have done something worse, but you're still guilty too. That's ultimately his point. Uh, basically, we have no room for judgment, and like you said, speck in the eye. Yeah. Right? The same measure you poured out on others, we pour back on you. If you're willing to look down on another person for their sin, mm -hmm. get ready, because God is going to look down on you for your sin. Mm -hmm. Were you going to say something? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's fine. I get sound out here. No, it's fine. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I think you sounded like I had something wrong at 12. I can just tell by your voice. Oh, no, no, no. You didn't have anything wrong. I was just, uh, I was trying to understand, because you said, um... Because I said... I was trying to understand what you were getting at whenever you said, act as if Jesus had maybe, come. Maybe there's a better way to word that, but I was saying, like, act as like Jesus never came, but don't take that, like, literally. Just take it like, you know, Jesus could not have come, and you would get 
like treat it as you're going to be judged without the blood of Christ anyway. Okay, that, I, that's I was mainly trying to figure out what you were like, what your main point was there. That so I wasn't saying anything was wrong there. So, um, okay, so you're suggesting like conduct yourself as if. Um, I, I well, think I, 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 I get okay, what, okay, yeah. the point I'm getting. Let me clarify. The point I'm getting at that is a lot of people will be like. Oh, I'm going to sin anyway. God's just going to like, I'm washed with the blood of Christ. I'm going to be forgiven anyway. I'm going to sin. No, I, I like, do that's agree That's where with I'm that. getting with that. Yeah, I do agree with that because there is a way as Christians where we kind of use the blood of Jesus as a cop-out. And we will justify sin and be like, oh, it's all right. I'm covered by the grace of God. Mm. No, like, yes, we have been forgiven. But the Bible is constantly warning us to not abuse God's grace. Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? No. No, <laughs> don't do that. Right, so I do agree with that. I was more just trying to figure out what point you were making there. Yeah, that, I, I do that, agree with that. that. Didn't, yeah. Now that I word it like that, it makes more sense. Yeah, so all because Jesus showed up doesn't mean you should, like, Jesus' death and resurrection does not change the call to obedience, right? Because ultimately, you were never saved by your obedience to begin with. If you go back to Genesis, Abraham was not saved by obedience. He was saved by faith. So salvation has always been by grace through faith. And if your goal is to simply be saved... Well, ultimately, you're not even worshiping God. You're worshiping yourself because you're simply wanting to do whatever it takes to serve your own needs. The goal is to serve God. And therefore, yes, we know that Jesus is the one we believe in, but that doesn't change the call to obedience, right? We are called to obey. And ultimately, I'm glad that you highlight that because that is exactly where James is going to lead us in the following verses, right? That's what Rocky is going to cover next week, right? Faith without works is dead, right? His whole point is that if you think that you can have faith, but it doesn't lead to life change, you might need to reevaluate your definition of faith because the Bible knows nothing of a faith that does not result in life change. Right? And so I, I do agree 100% with what you're saying. You know saying. what else I'm going to go well, kind of back then? It's going to kind of allude to something else I've been experiencing personally. But I've been going out and I've been fishing like a lot and I've been staying out like a lot late. And as I fish in my area, I like meet different people. And one of the things I feel like God's challenged me to do is like spread the gospel to these people. And what ended up happening Monday, I think it was, was it Monday night? No, I think it was Saturday night. Mm -hmm. I was out there, I was fishing, a gentleman comes up and you know, like we start talking about fishing things and then we start talking about like general life and then we start like, eventually he actually brought it up, I didn't, and then he brought up God and I'm like you know we started having this conversation about God for like 30 minutes 30 minutes an hour just talking about God what like and we started like comparing and contrasting our beliefs and then as like we progressed further we were like oh yeah yeah brother we read the same Bible and it was just amazing and then it was kind of like God's like you know you could be having these conversations with people all the time if you mm -hmm. just like talk about me yeah yeah we need to step our games up there mm -hmm. cool um, final thoughts real quick Verses 12 and 13. Um, so speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of freedom. Right? So all because you've been cleansed does not mean that you should change the way that you live. Right? Live as if every day, you know, like, because recognize that God is still watching. Right? And he actually expects more of those who are his. Right? He expects very little of those who are not. Like, if you don't call yourself a Christian, God doesn't expect you to follow his commandments. Right? Like, he, but that's, that's on us. Like, as Christians, I actually saw a meme that's been going around on Facebook. We're like, let me see if I can find it real quick. I 100% agree with it. It's been like all of my non-Christian friends are the ones who've been sharing it because they think it's a big gotcha to Christians. And in a way, I think they're actually correct because I think a lot of Christians don't understand um, this exact point. But it's very important. Um, hold up. Where is that? Okay. Um, it's that Jim Halpert, you know, being oh, like the office. Seen that. And it says, your religion does not prohibit me from anything. It prohibits you. Learn the difference. And I've had a lot of, like, my atheist friends or something being like, ha-ha, see, exactly, boom, mic drop. But I agree with the purpose of the, the meme, right? It's like, well, yeah. Like, as a Christian, I cannot expect a non-Christian to follow the commandments of God. I can't. Why would they? They're not Christians. However, as Christians, we are called to follow the commandments of God, and so we are called to a higher standard. And so that's what James is highlighting. Speak and act as those who are to be judged, right? Obviously, we're cleansed by the blood of Christ. But God is still watching, and we, by believing in him, are now his representatives on earth. And so we are called to live to a higher standard. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So it's actually 
living in light of the judgment of God that motivates us to be more merciful. A lot of times Christians do their, <laughs> they go the wrong way there. They're like, oh, well, if God is going to judge the world, then we need to be real jerks to everybody. Amen. Actually, it's motivation for mercy. Because the more mercy we show to other people, the more mercy God's going to show to us. And this isn't unique to James. Once again, Sermon on the Mount. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Right? That's the prayer. And then Jesus gives commentary. But he only gives commentary on one part of the prayer. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. He doesn't interpret any of the rest of the prayer. The only thing that he interprets is the only command in the entire prayer. Right? Everything else is saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. The one thing demanded of us is that we forgive other people as God has forgiven us. And he says, if you're not willing to forgive, don't expect God's forgiveness. That's strong language. James agrees. Judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. If you're showing favoritism to the rich people because you think that in some weird way their blessings are a testimony to the fact that they've been faithful to God, mm -mm. it's not good. Don't show partiality. Love everybody equally. The celebrity and the homeless person. The rich and poor among you. Everybody's voice should be heard equally. Not just the seminary student. Not just like, like everybody should be treated the same. Right? That's how we should live. Final thoughts, sir? I know we've gone over. No, no, it's, it's fine. I got, I got here late, but work's work. Yeah. Until anybody complains, I'm not going to complain about going over because... You know, I, 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 just, I, yeah. just get, I just get tired. Yeah. Just get yeah. See, go, like I started out tired, but going through the Bible wakes me up. And so, like, just the longer we go, like, we'd go for four hours, and I'd just be like, <laughs> I'd be bouncing off the walls by then. <laughs> so, uh, like, there's going to have to be a point where y'all are just like, David, we need to stop. Like, <laughs> 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 uh, do you have any final thoughts just about the um, overall thing, and then we can probably wrap it up? I got to say, there's just a lot to unpack here, yep. and... James does a real good job of like calling us out. <laughs> He's essentially just like, you guys are freaking idiots. <laughs> Come on. You're literally like, he says it you're life. literally like elevating the people <laughs> who are dragging you to court and cursing your name and cursing God's name. Yeah. Did that go the way you thought it was going to go? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Do any of y'all have final thoughts? Which we, 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 again, we laugh, but we also do that all the time. So yeah. that, that's all I have. It's like a dark laugh. A self-deprecating laugh. We're like, ha, ha. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and it starts crying. Laughing and then you're like crying that we actually do the same thing. We're yeah. like the person that looks and like, okay, I, I can see your speck in your eye there, but yeah. you don't even notice. If you, go in, if you go into the bathroom and look in the mirror, you can see that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, Rocky will be leading us next week. It will be exciting. Um, he has got a mighty task ahead of him because that is one of the um, – it, it's a it's a dense subject, but I think it will be good. Uh, yeah, you got it. I believe you. You can do it. Um, all right. Um, could you close it up, Drew? I can try. Yeah. All right. Dear Heavenly Thought, Father, thank you for allowing us to gather tonight and uh, read your word. And I pray that everybody learns something out of it. I think we can all apply what James has to say to our lives because we continue to pass judgment that is yours onto others. And through that, we make perceptions about people. And ultimately, some of the people we end up like setting out a real high place are just ultimate jerks. And James, I think... You know, when he spoke to James and then James spoke to us through you, I feel like he did, he did a really, y'all did a really good job of like telling us that like we're a bunch of freaking idiots without you <laughs> and that we should maybe look at your word and analyze these things with a different lens. And it reminds me of the song like, oh, I can't remember the song, 
But anyway, it's about the song, Let Me Borrow Your Eyes. I feel like we should just, you know, borrow your eyes for a second and analyze things and look at them before we act, cast judgment, or speak on the matter. And I just pray that everyone takes these lessons to heart and learns how to apply them in their life. Because again, faith without works is dead faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.